All right, we're going to be looking at two chapters today. The first chapter is Hebrews chapter 13. The second chapter is James chapter 3. Firstly, let's look at Hebrews chapter 13. Having the platform that the Lord has given us here at Liberty Fellowship is is a blessing, and sometimes it's a it's a challenge because there are some things that need to be addressed to the local body primarily, and yet I'm very cognizant that everything that I say is is also watched and heard by many many thousands of people all across the country including, as I mentioned earlier, before we went um, on the air, uh, including our enemies. And there are those who delight to hear anything uh, that they can use to fuel their criticism of us in general and me in particular. And so there are probably going to be some uh, segments in this message that they're going to like because they're going to think that they have ammunition for their criticism. And so I recognize that that is the case. So be it. Um, we will say what needs to be said to the church and those people out there that watch us and love us and whose hearts are with us I believe that will be the case when we're all finished. <laughs> Hebrews chapter 13, I want to give you uh, a, a spiritual, scriptural truth. I'll do the same in James chapter 3. Of course, all of which will be used to uh, support what I'm going to say in a little bit. I'm not, I'm not up here interested in preaching opinion I will give my opinion when I think it's necessary as I did last week I will add to that opinion again today whenever I give opinion I tell you it's opinion uh, so that I don't I'm not pretenseful in in my presentation my opinions if God knows my heart, my opinions are, are always predicated on spiritual, scriptural truth. They are not predicated on whim. They are not predicated on emotion. They're not predicated on knee-jerk reaction. If I stand in front of this congregation and give an opinion, it is thoughtful. It is deliberate. It is studied. Uh, it is not just haphazardly uh, given. I just, I've, I've been at this too long. I know how to distinguish and separate. So the scriptural principles are what we need to learn. The problem is, is that because of the lack of true Bible instruction, on behalf of the pulpits across America over the last half century or more. Most of our Christian people are totally, for the most part, ignorant of biblical principles. They're ignorant of them. They do not know how to apply them to anything in day-to-day -day life. It's all about me. We are the most self-absorbed, selfish, 
self-centered generation that this country has ever known. If the founding generation would have been as self-centered, as self-absorbed, as selfish as this generation, we would still be a crown colony of Great Britain. Those sacrifices would have never been made. They would not even known the principles behind the sacrifices. They wouldn't have known when the sacrifice was necessary and when it wasn't necessary. They wouldn't have known when it was lawful and when it wasn't lawful. When it was right in the eyes of God, not in the eyes of man, who cares? Well, we do care. But ultimately, it's got to be right in the eyes of God. Or it's not right. If it's only right in the eyes of men, that doesn't make it right. It's got to be right in the eyes of God. We can't even determine today as a generation. I'm talking about as a generation, as a whole, as a body politic. Christians included. We, we can't even tell when it's right, when it's wrong, why it's right, why it's wrong. Explain it beyond your personal prejudice and proclivity and bigotry and hatred. Explain it beyond that. And they can't do it. And the fault is the pulpits. The fault is the pulpits. If the American pastors were standing up in the pulpits, teaching their people these principles week by week, month by month, year by year, we would not even be where we are as a country today. It's not Hollywood's fault. It's not the entertainment world's fault. It's not Washington, D.C.'s fault. It's not the politicians' fault. It's not the court's fault. Yes, they all share culpability, of course, but that's not the blame. The blame is the pulpits. They're totally silent. And when they do teach, it's teaching people how to feel good about themselves. How I can feel good about myself when I'm not doing what I should be doing. That's what they teach. How can I feel good about myself when I'm not doing what I should be doing or when I'm doing what I shouldn't be doing? I know I'm not doing what I should be doing and I shouldn't do what I do, but, but hey, you're a great person. Everything's okay. You're okay. I'm okay. The world's okay. Everything's okay. God's smiling at us. Everything's fine. And the message that the churches are preaching today, all they're doing is they are stroking the egos of the pews. It's all they're doing. Stroking egos. If you came to have your ego stroked, by the way, you're in the wrong place. I don't do that. I never have, I never will. The truth is what we need. The truth will give us the foundation if we will accept the truth. That's a big if. If we will accept the truth, it gives us the foundation for all the things that we're going to be confronting day by day in our lives and as a nation. The truth is what's important. The principles of truth are, what, are what's important. To give us the foundation that we don't have. So, I'm going to give you some truths as found in Hebrews 13. I'm going to give you some truths as found in James chapter 3. Hebrews chapter 13 and verse 7. If Paul is the author of Hebrews, I believe he is. Remember them which have the rule over you, who have spoken unto you the word of God whose faith follow, considering the end of their coming.
conversation. Who's he talking about? He's talking about the pastors of the churches. Remember them that have the rule over you. Who have spoken unto you the word of God. Whose faith follow. Considering the end of their conversation. Conversation means manner of life. John Gill writes this. To remember them is to know, own, acknowledge, and respect them as their governors. To obey them and submit to them. To treasure up in memory their doctrines and exhortations. To be mindful of them at the throne of grace. To pray for them. And to take care of their maintenance and outward supply of life. Got real quiet here all real sudden, didn't it? Bless God, nobody's going to rule over me. And that's the attitude that a lot of people have, even in the church. We are all answerable to authority. Every single last one of us are answerable to authority. You can deny it if you want. You're going to stand before God one day and you're going to find out you're answerable to authority. And you always were. There's all kinds of authority that God has allowed men to have among society for the purpose of a peaceful and, and sane society. When we think of government, normally we think of civil government, but that's just one form of government. A father and a husband or a single mom in her home is a, is a government. The children that live in that home are accountable to that government. And rebellion against that government is a crime in heaven. It's a sin against God. There are governments political at various levels of which we owe our allegiance and our obedience there are governments among the, the business world, whether it be an employer or whatever the position might be and, and whatever gainful employment you, you are in. It could be different titles, different names, different responsibilities, but it all comes back to some type of authority, accountability, responsibility in the church. There is spiritual authority. All of this is established by God. Our heart is to be sensitive to that which God has given us as authority. And we should recognize the rightness of it, recognize the justice of it, recognize that we are accountable to that which God has given us as authority, and while no human being has a right to demand unlimited authority, and, I, and I've talked about this how many times over the last five years that I've been your pastor. That's what the Romans 13 book that we wrote is all about. I preached a series of messages on it. That go through the messages I preached, and I, I've repeated this principle over and over and over again no man has unlimited authority a father does not have unlimited authority a a pastor does not have unlimited authority a, a employer does not have 
unlimited authority. A governor does not have unlimited authority. A president, Supreme Court, any governing institution does not have unlimited authority. All human authority is jurisdictional in nature. It's all limited in scope. But within that jurisdiction, and providing that that leadership is right and righteous and violates no spiritual or natural law, we are obligated to submit to that authority. The problem is that so many people have the spirit of rebellion in their hearts. They refuse to submit to anyone. They are a God unto themselves. They see themselves as independent of any accountability to any person whatsoever. They refuse to be accountable to an employer. They refuse to be accountable to a pastor. They refuse to be un unaccountable to a police officer. They refuse to be accountable to anybody. That is stubbornness as defined in the Old Testament and according to God's word, stubbornness is as the sin of witchcraft. If you are a stubborn individual who refuses to recognize God-given authority in your life, you might as well be a witch. You're practicing witchcraft. Witchery. That's how pagan God sees that sin. There's nothing spiritual about it. There's nothing holy about it. There's nothing American about it. We are all accountable to authority. Even in the church. Look at verse 17 in chapter 13. Obey them that have the rule over you and submit yourselves for they watch for your souls as they that must give an account that they may do it with joy and not with grief for that is unprofitable for you. Did you see that verse? Hey, you believe the Bible or not? Come on. Don't take it up with me. This is Bible. I didn't write it. Obey them that have the rule over you. Submit yourselves. They watch for your souls as they that must give an account that they may do it with joy and not with grief for that is unprofitable to you. Here's what Albert Barnes writes about this verse. That they may do it with joy and not with grief. Greek words, not sighing or groaning as they would who had been unsuccessful. The meaning is that they should so obey that when their teachers came to give up their account, they need not do it with sorrow over the perverseness and disobedience of the hero. For that is unprofitable for you, he goes on. That is, they're giving up their account in that manner as unsuccessful in their efforts to save you would not be of advantage to you, but would be highly injurious. This is a strong mode of expressing the idea that it must be attended with imminent peril to their souls to have their religious teachers go and give an account against them. As they would wish, therefore, to avoid that, they should render to them all proper honor and obedience. You know what these verses are teaching? We're talking about God's men now. We're not talking about hirelings. There's a lot of hirelings in the pulpits. Deceivers in the pulpits. Money grubbers in the pulpits. They're not God's men. They're not God's servants. We're not talking about them. We're talking about real men of God, called of God, anointed of God, in the pulpit as demanded by God. What this verse is teaching is that at the judgment seat of Christ, 
we pastors are going to give an account to God for your conduct and your attitudes. We pastors are going, God is going to ask us about the flock that he gave to us. And we are going to be a witness to you at the judgment seat of Christ. And our witness will either be a positive witness of which you will profit, or it will be an, unprofit, an, an unprofitable witness which will be injurious to your judgment before God. That's what this verse is teaching. That's the heavy weight of responsibility that we share as a pastor and flock. And it's true no matter who the pastor is. If he's God's pastor, if he's God's man, this is a truth. I'm going to have to give a report for the people that were under my care as to their attitudes, their, their actions, their conduct. God is going to ask me that as their pastor. And in that day, that testimony will be absolutely truthful because there'll be no sin nature involved. Nothing but the spiritual body raised anew in Christ and therefore incapable of lying or even falsehood not intending to lie. I'm looking forward to giving that report in the lives of many, many people that I've pastored. And I'm not looking forward to giving that report in the lives of many others. But that report is coming. That is a spiritual truth that God has established in his word as a relationship between a pastor and flock. It is a serious relationship. And there are eternal consequences for both of us, pastor and flock at the judgment seat of Christ on how we accepted our responsibility, our duty under God in the scriptures. Obviously, this is talking to Christian people. There's one more verse in this chapter. Verse 24, salute all them that have the rule over you and all the saints, they of Italy salute you. Three times in this chapter, we are introduced to this doctrine of the pastor-flock relationship in accordance with spiritual authority given to the pastor and the personal accountability given to the flock. You ignore that at your own peril. And you can get mad and you can go off down the road to another pastor, all angry at the pastor you left, and guess what? The pastor you left is going to give an account for you and the new pastor is going to give an account for you. And some of you have been sh sh shopping and hopping around churches so many times, you're going to have dozens of pastors testifying for or against you at the judgment seat of Christ. Each one of them will give a testimony on your behalf. I wonder how many people in our church, churches even know this doctrine. I wonder how many have even been taught it one time. And yet we see it three times in that one chapter alone. And the word rule is the same word that is used to describe the governorship of civil authorities. It's the same word. It's the same authority, only a different dimension. A God-called pastor does not seek that authority. A God-called pastor 
never, when he accepted the call, was even aware of the magnitude of his authority and his position. It is God that calls. It is God that equips. It is God that charges. It is God that gives responsibility and accountability to those positions that he calls men to. If you are a father, single mother, employer, if you're a governor, if you're in a position of authority in whatever jurisdiction or limitation it might be, you likewise are going to be held accountable for your leadership. You have a leadership position. You have an authority, and God expects you to exercise the authority that he's given you. And if you choose not to do so, you will be held accountable for the lack of exercise of the authority that God has given to you because it was God's gift to you, God's calling to you, God's anointing to you. Your will was not the consideration. God's will is the consideration. So it's not just the pastor. It's any person in a position of authority and responsibility, whatever it might happen to be. That means that we that are in a position of authority must hold very sacred and very dear the authority that God gives us. And we that are under authority must hold that position very sacred and very dear as well. Are you getting this? Am I scaring you? Just Bible truth here. We all have authority and we are all answerable to authority. And this is a Bible issue. This is a doctrinal matter. This is a God-centered truth, not subject to human review or criticism. God will be judged by no man. So that is a clear doctrinal truth of the New Testament. Now, that being said, turn to James chapter 3. beginning very in verse 1. My brethren, be not many masters, knowing that we shall receive the greater condemnation. For in many things we offend all. If any man offend not in word, the same is a perfect man, and able also to bridle the whole body. He's leading up to the rest of the chapter. Behold, we put bits in the horses' mouths that they may obey us, and we turn about their whole body. Behold also the ships, which though they be so great, and are driven of fierce winds, yet are they turned about with a very small helm, whithersoever the governor listeth. Even so the tongue is a little member and boasteth great things. Oh, does it ever. Behold how great a matter a little fire kindleth. And the tongue is a fire, a world of iniquity. So is the tongue among our members that it defileth the whole body and setteth on fire the course of nature, and it is set on fire of hell. This is what Albert Barnes writes about verse 6. Perhaps the apostle meant to speak in a popular sense and thought of the affairs of the world as they roll on from age to age, 
as all enkindled by the tongue, keeping the world in a constant blaze of excitement. Whether applied to an individual life or to the world at large, everyone can see the justice of the comparison. One naturally thinks when this expression is used of a chariot driven on with so much speed that its wheels by their rapid motion become self-ignited and the chariot moves on amidst flames and set on fire of hell. Hell, Gehenna, represented, the Greek word, represented as a place where the fires continually burn. The idea here is that which causes the tongue to do so much evil derives its origins from hell. Nothing could better characterize much of what the tongue does than to say that it has its origin in hell and has the spirit which reigns there. The very spirit of that world of fire and wickedness a spirit of falsehood and slander and blasphemy and pollution seems to inspire the tongue. The image which seems to have been before the mind of the apostle was that of a torch which enkindles and burns everything as it goes along. A torch itself lighted as the fires of hell. One of the most striking descriptions of the woes and curses which there may be in hell would be to portray the sorrows caused on the earth by the tongue. John Gill writes these words on verse 6. But as fire should carefully be watched and kept, so should men take heed to their ways that they sin not with their tongue and keep their tongue from evil and their lips from speaking guile. For as fire kindles and rises up into a flame, so unchaste, angry and passionate words stir up the flame of lust, anger, envy, and revenge. And as fire is of a spreading nature, so are lies, scandal, and evil reports vented by the tongue. And as fire devours all that comes its way, such are the words of the evil tongue, and therefore are called devouring words in Psalm 52.4. They devour the good names of men and corrupt their good manners and destroy those who make use of them. And what wood is to fire, and coals to burning coals that are whispers, tail bearers, backbiters, and contentious persons of strife. So is the tongue amongst our members, that it defileth the whole body. Still quoting John Gill. The body politic. Listen to this. The body politic, a whole nation, filling it with contention, strife, division, and confusion. The ecclesiastical body, the church, by sowing discord, fomenting animosities, making parties, or having your cliques that you form your own little church inside a church, your little fellowship inside the fellowship. I wonder if some of you are here to promote and to help this fellowship and this pastor, or are you here to use the people of this fellowship to form your own fellowship? Which is it? And the natural body, and the several members of it, even the whole person of a man, soul and body, bringing upon him a blot of infamy and reproach never to be wiped off, as for instance the vice of the tongue, lying does. And oftentimes through the tongue, the actions done in the body, which seem good, are quite spoiled. 
19th century Bible theologians. That's the difference between theologians then and theologians now. You won't ever read anything like this in a modern theology book. The tongue corrupts the body politic, the whole nation, filling it with contention, strife, division, confusion. That's exactly where our nation is today. And it's due largely to an uncontrolled tongue by millions and millions of people, including Christians. The ecclesiastical body, the church, sowing discord, fomenting animosities, making parties, spreading errors. The temple of God is defiled. The tongue. You have every right as an individual with, with, a, with a conscience before God to disagree with any personal opinion that I might have on any subject. I have always acknowledged that, have never questioned that. You do not have a right as a part of this fellowship to go among this fellowship and to undermine the authority of the pastor of this fellowship. You do not have that right. If you cannot support the pastor where you are attending and have fundamental breaches of disagreement and conviction, the only honest thing for you to do, the only godly thing for you to do is to leave the fellowship in peace and either go to another fellowship where you can serve with conviction and a good conscience or have your own group at home and your own fellowship at home if you can't find anybody anywhere with him you can agree and there's some people I know I've met them for 40 years they've never met a pastor that is as spiritual as they are and they've never met a pastor that knows as much as they do. Those people don't belong in anybody's church. But whatever church you feel God would have you be in, whatever body, whatever fellowship God has called you to be a part of, you owe that pastor and you owe that fellowship your Loyalty, your allegiance, your prayers, your love, and your support. And if you don't do that, you are a hypocrite. The carnality and the evil tongue of church members for 40 years is driving my wife to an early grave has had untold impact on my family all because so-called Christians cannot control their tongue and they don't understand, or if they do, they've repudiated it, the fundamental Bible teachings as found in Hebrews chapter 13. Look at verse, let's say, well, I'll just keep going, I'll take you to the end of the chapter. For every kind of beast and of birds and of serpents and of things in the sea is tamed and hath been tamed of mankind. But the tongue can no man tame. It's an unruly evil full of deadly poison. Therewith bless we God, even the Father, and therewith curse we men, which are made after the similitude of God. 
Out of the same mouth proceedeth blessing and cursing. My brethren, these things ought not so to be. Doth the fountain send forth at the same place sweet water and bitter? Can the fig tree, my brethren, bear olive berries? Either a vine figs? So can no fountain both yield salt water and fresh? Who is a wise man and endued with knowledge among you? Let him show out of a good conversation his works with meekness and wisdom. But if you have bitter envying and strife in your hearts, glory not and lie not against the truth. If you were here this past Wednesday night in our Bible study in 1 John chapter 2, we read that passage that said, no lie is of the truth. And here, lie not against the truth. The truth. This wisdom descendeth not from above, but is earthly, sensual, devilish. For where envying and strife is, there is confusion and every evil work. God is not the author of confusion. If there's strife and envy and confusion, Guess who's the author of it? It's not God. At Bundy Ranch, there was no confusion. Truth was clear. Efforts were just. The so-called patriot or freedom community was united. I stood in front of the militiamen in Bundy Ranch. I stood alongside of Ammon Bundy, Cliven Bundy, and Ryan Bundy at their ranch, along with over a thousand other God-fearing, I think most of them, not all of them, most of them were God-fearing, freedom-loving people. It was a defensive action through and through. There were over a thousand, maybe two at the height of the conflict. Hundreds of federal agents. A volatile situation, of course. Not one shot fired. Not one life lost. God put his hand of protection on the men that participated in that just cause because it was a just cause. I don't care how you stack this up. The occupation of the refuge center in, outside Burns, Oregon was not a just cause. It was not lawful in the eyes of men. It was not lawful in the eyes of God. And God's hand of protection was not on it. Because of that, men made foolish decisions no matter how pure and right their heart might have been, they made foolish decisions. And just to let you know, I have been as inundated with data, information, video, testimony this, testimony that, expert witness this, expert witness that, 
as many of you has. I'm standing here today telling you I have seen nothing, I have heard nothing that has made me change my mind from what I told you last Sunday. I'd like to ask a question to all of these armchair quarterbacks using their computers in their living rooms to make all kinds of accusations to try and instill revolution in the hearts of patriots around the country, encouraging unlawful acts which are putting people's lives at risk every day now, including mine. What are you going to do if, and the one thing that I will agree with some of the people on the other side, is the honest observation that there is still a lot of things that we need to learn a lot more information we need to know, a lot more facts we need to be privy to before we can make an absolute and solid judgment on the matter. I don't care what side of the issue you're on, that is a fact. But that's not what's being done. This thing is being done like it's already fact. There is no room for the possibility that their conclusions might be wrong. And maybe it was a justified shooting. They don't even entertain that. They never open themselves to that possibility. It is a fact. It was an unjustified shooting. It's murder. It's a further example of tyranny from the federal government and the American people need to rise up. I've, I, I've read people call it another Bunker Hill, another uh, uh, Waco, another Ruby Ridge, another Lexington and Concord. In my opinion, it's none of the above. But what will they do if, if they discover all of their accusations were wrong and the Oregon State patrolmen were justified? What are you going to do then? I guarantee you there won't be one in a thousand internet bloggers that will have the character to get on their internet blog and to apologize for the inaccuracy of their tongue and say to the world, I was wrong. I owe those officers an apology. They did their duty admirably. I rushed to judgment. I'm wrong. There won't be one in a thousand, there won't be one in ten thousand that will do that. They'll just go on to the next event as if nothing ever happened. They learned nothing and they'll repeat the same thing over and over and over. See, here's the problem. No one is willing to accept accountability for anything they do or anything they say. If I'm wrong, I don't admit it and I just move on. No accountability for the consequences of that tongue and the, the fingers on, your, on the screen uh, of your, inner, uh, I mean, of your, on your keyboard as you post on the internet, that's just an extension of your tongue. 
There's no accountability for the tongue. It sets nations on fire and there's no accountability. Here's, here's what happens. A fusion center in Utah is advising law enforcement to be on the lookout for caravans of extremists traveling through the state. A number of individuals, several of whom were present at the Burns, Oregon occupation, are planning caravans from Utah and Nevada to travel to the funeral and show of support. It would be for LaVoy Finnegan, of course. By the way, that stuff going on, on the internet about this is the gun with the serial number that the FBI planted on Mr. Finnegan, an outright fabrication and lie. That gun does not exist. It's not the same gun. It's nothing related to it. It's an absolute phony. Easily proven so. I read where the family of Mr. Finnegan said that there were nine bullet holes in the body. Forgive me, the easiest way you could prove that would be to have an independent autopsy done, an official autopsy report documenting the bullet holes in the body, release that to the public, and then the whole world would know the truth of that matter. The fact that some family member says there were nine bullet holes in the body doesn't make it so. And now there has been video released that we didn't know existed until a few days ago by travelers on the same road where the arrest and the shooting took place, but from the backside of the roadblock, a hundred yards back from the roadblock, there was a traveler who took video from his cell phone with sound, turned it over to the local news media that released it about three days ago, proves conclusively there was no ambush. There was no ambush. That passenger car stopped just a few yards short of the roadblock behind it. If there had been an ambush, a barricade, and all of that scenario, if that had taken place, there would not a vehicle been allowed within miles of that location. Just like at Waco and Ruby Ridge, where everybody, including the media, was cartoned off, and no one could get close. This vehicle was just yards behind the roadblock right after it happened taking video along with sound. We're putting together our own video and that clip will be in there. Still a fact that that truck was not riddled with over a hundred bullets, that is still a fact. In the video that we're going to release, we're going to show the truck clean as a whistle except for the dents, a little bit of dents on the side from the, from the flashbang and the two bullet holes at the front window as the Mr. Finnegan tried to run around the roadblock and, and almost ran over and did actually hit an officer as he was trying to avoid arrest, make, making his, his vehicle a weapon against law enforcement personnel. Law enforcement personnel put two shots in the front windshield, which is probably a fragment of which is what 
grazed Ryan Bundy in the vehicle. He was not injured seriously at all. But the, the, the body of that vehicle is clean. Everybody walked out alive. And only Ryan had a scratch. Everybody was safe and healthy. No life was lost. And we're going to put up a picture of Bonnie and Clyde's car. The actual car. It's, on, it's in a museum. You can go look at it. The actual car, they were ambushed in. That's a, that was an ambush. 160 bullets went through that, that, the body of that vehicle. And those two people inside were absolutely riddled. That would have, those people, and those three people in the vehicle it, outside Burns would have been riddled with bullets if they had fired 120 rounds into that truck. That is still a fact. The only point of contention as I can see it is was he going for a gun when he put his hands into his coat, pulled his coat back, or as some are saying, he had already been shot and he was reacting to a shot. It's still a fact if Mr. Finnicum had have surrendered at the initial stop a mile up the road as Ammon Bundy, who was the primary target, the primary target was Ammon Bundy. He surrendered. He was taken peacefully, unharmed, into custody along with everybody else. And if Lavoie had a stop and surrendered as he, was, as he should have in the initial stop, as they were serving lawful arrest warrants, he would still be alive today and this would not be an issue. That's a fact. Is there room for speculation? You bet. Do we know all the answers? No. And I support the effort that I think is now underway to file a wrongful death suit against the authorities, not because I believe it was a wrongful death, because at this point in time, I do not believe it was a wrongful death, but by filing the wrongful death suit, you will have the right of discovery. And you'll be able to subpoena necessary evidence. And that is needed. But what is this caught? What is this produced? Confusion, discord, animosity, hatred. I've been in this fight since 1979. You wouldn't believe the email I've gotten the last two weeks. People calling me every possible name you can think of. I'm a betrayer to freedom. I'm, I, I'm not, I, don't, I don't have the right to call myself a patriot pastor. I'm a Judas Iscariot. I'm a Benedict Arnold. Those are the nice words. But let me tell you something, folks. This is not a game with me. And this is not getting on a computer and venting with me. This is life and death with me. And like my dad told me when I was a teenager, son, when the bullets start flying, be sure you're on the right side. With God as my helper, I'm going to be sure I'm on the right side. <sighs> Utah Statewide Information and Analysis Center, SIAC, reports... Law enforcement should remain cognizant of the likelihood of the presence of domestic extremists traveling within their AOR, area of responsibility. 
This may include both militia extremists and sovereign citizen extremists. The SIAC bulletin produced on February 3rd mentions unspecified number of events related to the Finnegan funeral. Utah SIAC is currently monitoring activities surrounding these events to assess any potential threat towards law enforcement or to the public safety of those in attendance. The SIAC is also in contact with fusion centers in surrounding states. There's a fusion center right here in Kalispell, Montana. In surrounding states to facilitate information sharing regarding the upcoming events. SIAC believes armed extremists and potentially volatile persons may seek to infiltrate a confrontation, excuse me, seek to initiate a confrontation with law enforcement as they pass through Utah. The SIAC report is similar to a previous report issued by the Missouri Information Analysis Center, MIAC, entitled The Modern Militia Movement, released on February 20th, 2009. A copy of the report was sent to media by a Missouri police officer. The MIAC report connected supporters of the militia movement to former presidential candidate Ron Paul, Chuck Baldwin, and Bob Barr. It also cited patriotic imagery and symbols including the Gadsden flag, the common law sovereign citizen flag, upside down U.S. flag, and the first Navy Jack. In March 2009, Chuck Baldwin sent a letter to the governor of Missouri, Jeremiah Nixon, protesting the Missouri Information Analysis Center's document designating him, Paul, and Barr as domestic terrorists. The letter demanded the MIAC document be immediately removed from any and all websites associated with or maintained by the state of Missouri or any agency thereof, including the MIAC, after the report was published and Baldwin sent his letter, Highway Patrol Superintendent James Keithley put a halt to circulating the report and Missouri Lieutenant Governor Peter Kinder called on the Director of the Public Safety Department to be placed on administrative leave pending an investigation of the report. Whose name is prominent in this SIAC report? Whose name? My name. My name. Not yours. Not all these hot-headed guys out here on the internet calling for civil war. My name. My family. Newsweek came out this week with a huge article on ma by magazine terms, huge article. Typically and predictably inspired by the left-wing, hate-filled group at the Southern Poverty Law Center. My name is mentioned repeatedly in that article. A Reuters report came out this week in similar vein. My name prominent in that report. I was in Nevada with Mr. Bundy. Some of you were there. I was proud to be there. The cause was just. I'll take whatever heat would come from that. I've spoken out 
vociferously since I had my radio talk show when Ruby Ridge and Waco took place. I sat up and watched the taped video of the congressional hearings on, on Waco every night for as long as they lasted, for months, many weeks. I would stay up till four or five o'clock in the morning reviewing that video. I would then get up in the morning and do my radio talk show and report. I poured over the testimony, trying to separate false testimony, even though it may have been sincerely given. A lot of testimony is sincerely given, but it's untruthful and inaccurate. And it has to be dissected and analyzed, inspected, compared. And I did that for week after week after week after week. And made my position extremely clear on what I saw as egregious government injustice against the Branch Davidians at Waco. Same thing for what happened at Ruby Ridge. I'm not afraid to take a stand that's controversial. If in my heart, after a studious appraisal of the situation, I am convinced that it's the right position to take. So now, 2016, and an unlawful occupation, armed occupation of a federal facility takes place of which I never supported from the beginning, wrote a column explaining why it was not right. From the very beginning, the tactics of Mr. Ammon Bundy and his fellows at Burns was wrong. Legally, morally, biblically, natural law, any assessment, it was wrong. They refused to make it right. After being pled with by fellow patriots to try and make it right, they refused to make it right. And the last thing any of us wanted to have happen was what happened. But it happened. And in my, in my view, Mr. Finnegan, sadly, though he was sincere, good man, nothing in his heart, I don't think, was wrong but he acted wrongly. I encourage everyone again to get the video that my attorney's son put together, Police Contact, How to Respond. When you're put in contact with police, what's the right thing to do? Everything Mr. Finnegan did violated the principles contained in this video. And now people are spreading accusations, calling for civil war, revolution, violence. So guess what? SIAC goes into operation. Fusion centers go into operation. And whose name do they use the most? Mine. This is why I say this is not a game with me. So after I'm gone, by whatever means, 
that takes me out. None of the bloggers who've been using the, the tongue to incite violence will think anything about it and take no accountability for it. Oh, gee, that's too bad. Chuck's gone. Oh, well, good riddance. He didn't support the thing anyway. There are consequences for our actions. There are consequences for our tongue. And I'm having to pay the consequences for everybody else's tongue. And I got to tell you, I'm a little ticked about it. I'm a little ticked about it. The target on my back just magnified a hundredfold. And I had nothing to do with any of it. In fact, I believe and said so from the beginning, it was wrong. Doesn't matter. I'm the target. So keep writing those blogs and keep inciting people to violence and keep being irresponsible about what you say with no thought of who might be harmed. I can't tell you what my heart and my emotions are screaming at me. Those bloggers aren't paying a price at all. Nothing. They're risking nothing. Sitting home in their pajamas, writing their insightful, hateful, mostly untruthful remarks. At least we can say if they're not untruthful, they're unknown. They're only surmisals. That's the best you can say about it. They're surmisals. But the, the red dot is put on my chest. Not theirs. Look at verse 18. Well, verse 17, the wisdom that is from above is first pure, then peaceable, gentle, easy to be entreated, full of mercy and good fruits without partiality, without hypocrisy. And the fruit of the righteousness is sown in peace of them that make peace. You see that verse? The fruit of righteousness is sown in peace of them that make peace. Albert Barnes writes, is sown in peace, is scattered over the world in a peaceful manner. That is, it is not done amidst contentions and brawls and strifes. The farmer sows his seed in peace. The fields are not sown amidst the tumults of a mob or the excitements of a battle or a camp. Nothing is more calm, peaceful, quiet, and composed than the farmer as he walks with measured tread over his fields, scattering his seed. So it is sowing the seed of the kingdom in preparing for the great harvest of the righteousness of the world. It is done by men of peace. It is done in peaceful scenes with a peaceful spirit. A peaceful spirit is lacking today. I understand 
the frustration that we all have with the abuses of government. No one understands that more than I do. I've been fighting this fight longer than most of the people that are blogging all this stuff have even lived. But our hearts must have the peace of God in them. Contentious spirits, contentious hearts are not of God. And God cannot use such people. Right now, the way it is, all these people that say they are fighting for freedom, they're really not fighting for freedom. You know what they're doing? They're doing everything to facilitate tyranny. They're making it easier for government to become more intrusive. They're giving them the excuses they need to become more abusive. They're creating the atmosphere by which tyranny can grow out from. They are not promoters of liberty. They are sowing the seeds of their own destruction. Brandon Smith had a very good take on all of this in a column that he wrote this week in his webpage, Alt Market. If you've not read it, I encourage you to read it. If we don't get smarter about the way we fight this liberty fight of ours, if we don't, as Christians, get a good old-fashioned dose of the love and the peace of God in our hearts, so that we can operate as spiritual men and women, it's all over. Because the way it's going right now, all we're doing is making it easy for the enemy to defeat us. It is done in a peaceful scene with peaceful spirits. It is not done in the tumult of war or amidst the horse brawling of a mob. In a pure and holy life, in the peaceful scenes of the sanctuary and the Sabbath, by noiseless and unobtrusive laborers, the seed is scattered over the world and the result is seen in abundant harvest in producing peace and order. We who love liberty and believe in constitutional government should be setting an example for everyone else, including law enforcement, that we are for peace and order and good government and the Constitution and the rule of law and righteousness and things that are good and pure and right. We should be setting the example So that even those on the other side can take note of our heart, our spirit, our temper, our mind. And diffuse their angst against us. We're fueling their angst against us. We need to be diffusing it. So I've got to talk with our local law enforcement officials here. And I've got to have a sit down with them. And hopefully with God helping me, I can make them understand that what they read in the SIAC report, because they surely did read it, is not true about Chuck Baldwin or Liberty Fellowship. Amen. And if you are of another persuasion and you choose to not submit 
to the spirit of this fellowship and the leadership of this pastor, then please do the honest thing and leave. We don't have to have a big, nice room at the Hilton. We can take the camera and the microphone to a small, private place, and we can still preach to the country the message of liberty. This is not about numbers. It's not about numbers. The fact is, in most churches, the bigger the church, the more apostate the church. That's not always true, but generally it seems to be. It's not about numbers. It's already been made very hard for me. It's already what's been done. has made it really hard for me. And I promise you those three or four national publications and that one police report that came out this week is not the end. I promise you this, this coming week there'll be more reports just like that and more stories just like that. And they're going to regurgitate and regurgitate what others say. Barnes goes on, by those who desire to produce peace or who are of a peaceful temper and disposition, they are engaged everywhere in scattering these blessed seeds of peace, contentment, and order, and the result shall be a glorious harvest for themselves and for mankind, a harvest rich and abundant on earth and in heaven. The whole effect, therefore, of religion is to produce peace. Can I say that again? The whole effect of religion is to produce peace not war not contention not strife peace it is all peace peace in its origin and its results in the heart of the individual in society on earth in heaven the idea with which the apostle commenced this chapter seems to have been that such persons only should be admitted to the office of public teachers Unfortunately, the internet has made everybody a teacher. Everybody's a reporter. Everybody's a know-it-all. Everybody's an expert. And they're not men of peace. The mind naturally turns to the effect of religion in general. And he states that the ministry and, in, and out of it, in the heart of the individual and on society at large, here and hereafter, the effect of religion is to produce peace. Its nature is peaceful as it exists in the heart and as it's developed in the world and wherever and however it's made manifest. It is like seed sown, not amid the storms of war and the contentions of battle, but in the fields of quiet husbandry, producing a rich abundance of harvest and peace. In its origin and all of its results, its productivity only of contentment, sincerity, goodness, and peace. Happy is he who has this religion in his heart. Happy is he who with liberal hand scatters its blessings broadcast over the world. Albert Browns, mid-19th century. Our job is education. Our job is providing from this platform to the Christian population of America the biblical and natural law principles that produce the results that we all desire. Without the principles un understood, the results will never happen. We must bring the body politic to an understanding. We haven't done that. We're not doing it. Yes, we're battling the mainstream media. 
Yes, we're battling most of the higher institutions of, of learning. No doubt, there's a lot of information on the other side that we've got to, that we have to wade through to get people's ear and to get their attention. But we're not going to get their attention and we're not going to get their support by being a bunch of hothead, overreacting revolutionaries who don't think but only act out of raw emotion. We're never going to get anyone's support with that conduct, kind of conduct. I said before, if my conclusion on the matter in Oregon is wrong and the evidence proves that my conclusion is wrong, I will publicly say so. How about you on the other side? Will you do the same thing? And in the meantime, the verbiage, the hostility, the hatred, the anger, the incitement to violence, that's all over the internet. It's putting my life in danger. And frankly, I don't appreciate it. All of your pious platitudes notwithstanding. I and my family take it personal. As we go forward as a fellowship, I'm going to do my best to make it clear to anyone who will listen that our conduct, our actions, must be predicated upon the principles of truth. And I will continue to try to educate and teach those principles from natural law, from biblical law, from history, try to show anyone and everyone who will have a heart to listen that we are not just a bunch of anti-government haters who do not understand the principle of biblical authority. Because we do understand the principles of biblical authority. And I respect every judge, every policeman, every government official in whatever capacity who is doing his or her dead level best honestly to, to be faithful to their pledge that they took when they were sworn in to defend the Constitution of the United States. I respect them. And beyond that, I respect the positions of those who are themselves not faithful to their oath. I think we got a whole lot of politicians in Washington, D.C. that are not faithful to their oath. That doesn't mean that we don't respect the position they occupy. And I will do my best, however successful I'm going to be, to distinguish myself from where I have been heaped, put into the camp of the hot-headed civil unresters who seem to have no desire except to cause conflict 
in our country. I don't want conflict. I want to see the body politic properly educated, motivated, and inspired to rise up for the principles of our Constitution and our Declaration and the natural law principles on which they were built so that we can take care of these things that have eroded in our country. And going back to where I started, if the pastors of America would help us a little bit, we could get the job done. Folks, get in or get out. Let's stand for prayer.